The demise of tobacco started well before the recent buyout. Labor shortages, lower profit margins, and increased land values, not to mention increased awareness of the medical dangers of smoking, conspired to make it harder for a tobacco farmer to make a living from his or her fields. That said, it is still considered to be the money crop, second only to marijuana in earnings per acre. Tobacco has the obvious advantage of being legal to grow. Labor costs had become a real issue in tobacco farming. When people could make more money at jobs that did not require the backbreaking effort of working tobacco, it became very difficult to find people to help, especially in the summer when farmers needed extra workers. The lack of hired help was a recurring complaint among tobacco farmers. Some farmers had to reduce their acreage to keep up with a diminishing labor supply and sagging market price. Although tobacco was the most productive and profitable crop per acre, it was labor intensive to grow and bring to market. And over the years, increased labor costs cut into the profit margins for tobacco on even the largest farms. The larger the farm, the more hired hands were needed, often at a daunting price. Some farms lost money by the time they finished paying for labor, fertilizer, and fuel. Dealing with labor could wear a farmer down. Workman's compensation, liability, and insurance paperwork became more time-consuming. The decline in the availability of labor became more noticeable when the region's population started to grow. Many workers left the field to work construction, realizing they could make better money all year round. Earl Buddy Hance talks about labor issues. You know, the local black families depended on the farmers for their income. You had plenty of help. In the early, late 70s, early 80s, that started changing. The population grew and there were more jobs. The help became scarcer and scarcer. And there, the last four or five years that we grew to action, we actually used migrant Mexicans to get the work done. Tobacco farming is very hard work, and there's only a short period of time when we really need a lot of labor. When I grew up, all the kids worked on the farms because that's how they made their money to buy their school clothes or bikes or whatever they wanted. Well, now the parents give them money, and they can go to McDonald's and get a job and make more money than we could afford to pay them. So it was the major reason we took the buyout. Profit margins got narrow. You had to grow, you know, a volume of acres to make a living, and then it took that much more help to work that much acres, so it was just a squeeze. We could just see the end coming before the buyout was ever. The buyout was really just icing on the cake, if we were going anyway. I mean, there were days there in the end, in the summer we were cutting the back and it'd be the three of us and some black ladies in the neighborhood that helped us and none of them were under 60. That's pretty scary. <laughs> when, when your future is dependent on three people you know, us three and then uh, senior citizens to do the kind of work we were doing. In August, when you're cutting tobacco, that's, that's the hardest part. It's uh, hard work, it's hot, days are long, but it kept you in shape. But that's the way we grew up, so we were used to it. You didn't notice it. Now I notice it because I get a check in about 10 pounds a year now. Uh, but we enjoyed it. Well, as I said, you know, the middle age, uh, type of help that my father got to rely on, those people, you know, they got better paying jobs. Especially when they built the power plant, that, a lot of them say that's really when it started, because that created a lot of jobs. I think at that time it was like $7 an hour, and on the farm they were paying like two or three. You just lost that pace, and the younger generation didn't want to do the work, it's too hard. And so you were stuck with that older generation that really couldn't do anything else. That was your labor base. The second nail in the coffin was the slackening demand for Maryland tobacco from large buyers such as Philip Morris and R.J. Reynolds. After the mid-80s, there was a gradual decline in demand. If the farmer didn't have a really good crop, he would be fighting to get it on the market because the buyers would only be willing to purchase it for a certain amount of time. The rising cost of living also took its toll. Many farms have been sold for development. In days past, most of the development occurred when the family gave or sold lots to family members to enable them to farm their own land and raise their families nearby. But with skyrocketing land values, the farms have been sold to developers and subdivided for luxury homes or commercial ventures. On November 23, 1998, 
the master settlement agreement ended the lawsuit between the major U.S. tobacco companies and the attorney generals of 46 states, including Maryland. In this agreement, the tobacco companies agreed to pay the states $206 billion over 10 years. Maryland's share of the settlement was about $4.4 billion. In a far-reaching decision, Maryland Governor Paris N. Glendening chose to allocate a portion of Maryland's share to sponsor a voluntary buyout of the state's tobacco farmers. Glendening announced that in sponsoring the buyout, we are taking aggressive action to close the book on Maryland's tobacco heritage and improve the health and quality of life for all Marylanders. These assertions would echo in the heads and hearts of all of Southern Maryland's farmers as they struggled to decide what to do with their lives. The main goal of the Tobacco Crop Conversion Task Force was to get Maryland's tobacco farmers out of tobacco production and into sustainable agriculture, preserving the agricultural heritage in Southern Maryland. The initial estimates were that Maryland would pay the farmers $78 million over 10 years. One of the main purposes was to develop a program that would help the tobacco farmers make the transition into growing other crops. In the first year, approximately 68% of the farmers signed up for the program. The effect on the tobacco crop was immediate. In the end, almost all eligible Calvert County farmers participated. The most problematic portion of the buyout was called the Covenant. The Covenant prevented the land from being used for producing tobacco during the lifetime of the buyout participant. The Covenant would also hold if land were sold or transferred during the 10-year span of the buyout program. The only way a farmer could sell tobacco was if he or she had tobacco that was produced years before the buyout took effect. The one clause in the Covenant, growers must give up all interest in tobacco, has caused the most consternation and debate. The other components of the buyout were land preservation and infrastructure. When signing on for the buyout, farmers promised to keep their land in agricultural production for at least 10 years. Tobacco farmers have mixed feelings on the buyout. Most saw the writing on the wall because of the labor shortages. Many were reaching their senior years and thinking about getting out anyway. But the culture was so pervasive and the lifestyle so ingrained that many farmers had a very difficult time taking the buyout and making transitions to other crops and types of farming.